And I'll uh, be looking out for that tomb guide in the near future. Hopefully we'll get it out within the next week or so. That's what we're planning out, hopefully. Hey guys, what is going on? It is me, Box 12 here, and welcome to the long-awaited and anticipated Tomb of the Ancients guide video. I have alongside me EDKI, aka Homies of Mars, to help me out with this one, making his annual appearance. And... Yeah, it's been a while. You ready for this? Yeah, I'm really surprised we're actually getting to it after two years of putting it off. Time to do what we promised, though. Sounds good to me. Let's jump right into this. The first thing to know about the Tomb of the Ancients is that it drops from the Once Per Realm Grand Sphinx. And once inside, you'll notice that you spawn right in the boss room. However, the bosses are not yet activated. In order to awaken them, you have to follow your quests on the map in order to find and destroy the five sarcophagi. And because of where they're located, you'll end up combing most of, if not all, of the dungeon. So depending Depending on your situation, this can take you a pretty long time to complete. So you've got two options here, rush or clear. Odds are, if you're in a public tomb, you probably don't even have to leave spawn. More likely than not, there's going to be a rogue in the dungeon that can go invisible and rush past all of the obstacles, use its plane walker to teleport over the walls, and get to the sarks really fast. If you want to, you can act as an anchor for these rushers. Just stand at spawn, be safe, and don't pause. Now anytime the rusher is stuck in a pinch or is about to die, he or she can teleport back to you and attempt their rush once again. I'll be passing it over to Edie KI for now, to briefly talk about what goes on when rushing a tomb. But I should warn you, he won't be saying much about the enemies and hazards. That's my department. Rushing a tomb is going to be the best way that you're going to be able to complete tombs, especially if you're doing it with friends. Alright, you can rush by yourself, that's fine, but it's going to be a little bit more riskier to rush by yourself. But if you're going to be in a tomb with multiple people, rushing is definitely the way to go. You're going to want to make sure you have the right class for rushing. And now every class can rush, yes. I mean, if you're crazy enough, right? But there's some classes that are better at it than others. Knights and rogues are probably the best. You can also do like paladins and whatnot, or warriors for that matter. Warriors also aren't half bad. Even ninjas to a certain degree. But really, thinking about it, the smart way is that a rogue can go invisible and is really fast, and a knight can take a lot of damage and stun enemies. And really, in a tomb, you're mainly watching out for the status effect from certain enemies in the rooms. Paralyzing and armor breaking are probably the scariest things when you're rushing, but mainly scarabs. Are the problem with scarabs is that you know they, they can paralyze you but when you run around in a tomb a lot they'll start to clump up together and they can make like huge armies of scarabs that can come and just attack you which is why you want to make sure you have an anchor for the most part you know if you want to stay safe just uh, just have something typed out in your chat bar and if something goes wrong you can just teleport to them instead of having a nexus because you, you don't want a nexus in a tomb I mean that's gonna that sucks make sure you have an anchor make sure you do the right class and just be aware of your surroundings rushing a tomb really isn't that bad especially if you're on a rogue like rogue you should be fine just man you know manage your mana and if you got a pet even better like if you have a really really good pet then then rushing a tomb is next to just stupid easy it takes like no skill at that point would recommend that you are a max character at least in defense and speed you don't have to again it's just going to be a lot harder if you're not also using the right cloak cloak of the plane walker super great for for rushing tombs tricksters actually aren't half bad either for rushing tombs they're actually really really good as well tricksters are you know require a they're fairly takes takes a lot of skill because you, you don't want to make sure you to teleport on the middle of some enemies and you get you know wrecked so yeah that's that's pretty much my whole thing on rushing not too big of a deal just be aware. Stay away from the paralyzing turrets and manage the uh, the enemies that you're in the room with because the, the rooms are filled with enemies, but they're not going to be that bad. Some rooms are going to be worse than others. Some rooms are going to be like nothing in them. In conclusion, though, rushing is a very ballsy thing to do, but it's very worthwhile in the long run. If you do it right, you're going to be just fine. Just stay away from scarabs as much as possible. Don't get paralyzed. And if you have to, make sure you always teleport to your anchor. Just And, and don't look, don't be afraid to nexus because it's not worth losing your character if your, your anchor doesn't work or you don't have an anchor. It's not worth it. Trust me. Tombs are nice, but your character's probably nicer. <laughs> All right. Well said. Couldn't have said it better myself, in fact. Oh, then again, that's probably just because I can't rush for shit. But if you plan on clearing this dungeon room by room with a few other people, here are the enemies and hazards you gotta watch out for. First up, we've got a couple of traps, namely the bomb trap and elemental turrets. There can be up to eight bomb traps in a room, and they're always in a circle pattern. Every 1.5 seconds, it'll toss a red grenade into the air, and whenever it lands, it'll spread across the ground, dealing 120 damage. The only way to deactivate these traps is to stand on the switch in the very middle for three seconds until it clicks. The problem here is that it puts you at the center of attention for any enemies that might be in that room. So unless you're really confident that you won't get hit, I would say lure the enemies towards the hallway and take them out there. In fact, a general rule of thumb for this entire dungeon, when you're approaching a new room from your corridor, take a peek to see what's on the other side, and if you see enemies, run back and assess the situation. Try and draw aggro to those enemies and lure them towards you, so you can bring them out of the room, attack them while they're chasing you, and bring them into the room you were just in that you know is safe. That's pretty much how any new player is going to be approaching these rooms. The elemental turrets are a bit more involved. We have three 
types, but two variations each. They can also spawn in either the center or corners of rooms. In the case of the thunder turrets, we have one that fires two continuous yet slow streams of bullets in a clockwise pattern, making it easy to predict, but giving us a lot less room to work with. And the second one firing four incredibly fast shots in all four directions, and also slowly rotating clockwise. Since it's a lot faster, it's harder to avoid and can easily surprise you, but it's much less frequent and can be more forgiving. But if you do get hit by them, you'll be paralyzed for 1.4 seconds and can be dealt anywhere from 10 to 100 and 10 to 80 damage, depending on which turret you're fighting. So this one's extra scary if you're trying to run away from something. I also want to point out that the same turret will always appear in the center and the other will always appear in the corners. They don't alternate. At least that's what I saw in Roma. Love you. The fire turrets are my least favorite, because they can armor break you for two seconds. The corner turrets can deal between 30 and 70 damage, and also fire at the nearest player, meaning they're heat seeking, which is especially painful when it's placed right outside your hallway. And the center turrets deal between 20 and 60 damage, which fire in three directions. They're both pretty quick, but don't have too much range. They're really only an issue if they're placed in an inconvenient spot. The frost turrets are luckily the least offensive, the ones on the outside dealing 70 damage and slowing for two seconds, and the middle turrets dealing 60 damage and slowing for four seconds. The outer ones are similar to the fire turrets in that they heat seek towards the nearest player, and the center ones will fire in five directions, but a lot slower. But I would take slow any day over paralysis and armor broken. For our actual enemies, we have the Tomb Gang, made up of the Eagle Sentry, Lion Archer, and Jackal Priest. The Eagle Sentry can be tough to deal with because it's basically a running tank. 4,000 health, it's fast on its feet, and very rarely does a moment go by where it's not shooting something. I'd say try to push this one towards a corner and wait for it to stop moving around, and use that opportunity to give it all you've got. Lion Archers are the scariest of the three, mainly because you can get paralyzed by the black arrows for 1.2 seconds, but the green arrows can also slow you for 4 seconds. The same principle applies here, try luring it towards a corner, and wait for it to stand still, and then make your move. The Jackal Priest for me has always been the easiest to deal with, but is definitely no pushover. If you sit on it, you could be dealt anywhere between 600 and 700 damage, an insta-kill for many classes. But in my experience, he's always been much less mobile than the other two, and it's also got less health, so there's that. Now it should be noted that the Eagle Sentry can put up a wooden shield, and give itself an armor buff, and the Lion Archer and Jackal Priest can put up a blue shield, granting them temporary invulnerability. It doesn't last very long though, but it's still something to take note of. Now let's talk Jackals. We got the Jackal Lord that spawns the Jackal Warrior, Veteran, and Assassin. And from the looks of it, the Jackal Lord can actually heal his minions for like a thousand HP, but only one at a time. Man, what a nice guy, healing his minions, doesn't even bother to heal himself. Alright, I'm a level with you guys. I like the Jackals. These look like actual guardians of an ancient tomb. I'm gonna tell you right now to not let your guard down no matter what Jackal you're fighting. All three of the minions will chase after you. And even though they're small, they can drain you pretty fast. Luckily, you do have speed on your side and can run away and damage them while running, so just do that. And when the Jackal Lord gets below a certain amount of health, he'll stop spawning them and actually run away from you. It's no wonder he was healing his goons. He's dependent on them. The Jackal Lord, though, is really tough. 6,000 health and he's actually kind of misleading. When far away, he'll kind of just meander around, seemingly with no reason, and then randomly, he'll start chasing you with a pretty decent ground speed. And each bullet he fires is worth 100 40, and those stack fast. You can do the same thing as with the minions, run away and fire, but I find that archers have a pretty good advantage when clearing the tomb because they can paralyze all of the enemies that just move around and give you a hard time. Maybe that's just me. Now we got a couple of miscellaneous enemies, bloated mummies and scarabs. Compared to most of the enemies in this dungeon, the bloated mummy doesn't come up very often. While I can't speak for everybody on that, that is generally what I encounter. It'll occasionally flash and grow a little bit. When it does this, it'll start firing out a whole bunch of green stars. Strangely enough, there are two types. They're both green, they both deal 30 damage, but one of the types confuses you for two seconds, meaning you don't want to get hit by any of them. It'll then spawn scarabs as it shoots its green stars. Scarabs are these weak little bugs that have the ability to paralyze you for 0.8 seconds, and in large numbers, that can add up really fast. If you can't kill them fast enough, you're going to keep on getting paralyzed. And later down the road, I'm going to talk about why that's such a big issue. But the mummy is not hard on its own. Wait for it to stop shooting, kill it, and then more scarabs will spawn. Kill those quickly. End of story. Now let's talk swarms. I don't know about you, but I find these to be the scariest enemies in the whole dungeon. Now that may be because a red master almost popped my archer the other day. Just, just maybe. But trust me, they're nothing to take lightly. They're swarms, it's in the name. There is inherently a lot of things going on with them. You gotta shave off the minions if you want to damage the masters. But the masters keep spawning minions, putting them in your way. It takes longer. The red ones have the ability to armor pierce you. The yellow ones can blind you for four seconds and confuse you for two. The blue masters, thankfully, aren't as offensive, but they still got wavy shots that can weaken you for 1.2 seconds, and they've all got a pretty wide spectrum of damage. Long story 
short, don't stop attacking. Make continuous contact with these swarms, and try to stay as far away as your weapon permits. Alright, so that was a lot of enemies to talk about. When you finally make it to a Sark, don't immediately start attacking it. It's pointless to do so right now. The worshipping priests and priestesses that are surrounding it will just continue to heal it. What you want to do is take these priests out one by one. Make sure you don't get hit by their crescent shots though because it weakens you, making the process even longer. And don't attack any other priests while you're doing this. As soon as you attack them, they'll awaken, now you've got two to deal with, twice the damage, twice the weakens to avoid. Just take this one at a time and avoid the whole mess. If you have enough firepower though, it is possible to use a knight to stun, a warrior to buff rate of fire, and a pally to buff the damage, and pop these sarks really quickly without killing any of the priests. But that's more of an advanced technique that will come later down the road. Just keep on doing this until all of the priests are dead and just start attacking the sark. It has no way of actually hurting you, even whenever it fires out bullets, they only stun you, sort of a last resort to defend itself. It can even drop some tinctures to pop right before the boss fight, giving you some temporary stat buffs. Tomb of the Ancients also has a treasure room. Now this treasure room is pretty basic. All it consists of is a tea sark or a treasure sarcophagus that uh, basically just sits in the middle of the room. It has 50,000 health and 100 defense. Now the thing about this thing is, is that it just sits there. And once you start activating it, it'll start to spawn these little jars around it. There's actually eight that go around it, and they drop like health potions and mana potions, but they also can spawn scarabs as well. But the actual sarcophagus itself doesn't actually attack you. So basically, once you get into the room, you just you know, tell whoever's uh, uh, just sitting in the main room or waiting for you, just tell them to teleport to you, or you can be mean, and you know, if you rush the tomb, you can secretly do the tear sark yourself, and nobody will ever know. That's what used to happen in, in my old days of playing in tombs. It does drop a potion of defense, attack, and speed, and then it also can drop 9 through 10 tiered weapons and 9 through 10 tiered armors. It also drops tier 4 rings. But it does drop the Shindite of Geb, which is a part of the Geb set. But here's an interesting thing about tea rooms in the tomb. So if you have five Sarks in a tomb, then once you kill the fifth Sark, then the bosses will, you know, will activate and then you can go and start killing Best Nut and Geb. But if you have, if you just happen to kill two or three Sarks, maybe just one Sark, and the tomb activates, then that means that there are a number of tea rooms left. So, let's say you killed three Sarks, and the tombs activates, and the and the bosses start circling. Well, that means there's two tea rooms, because that means there's there's only a maximum of five Sarks in the entire tomb, whether that's tea Sarks or just standard Sarks. But remember, normal Sarks are the only thing that actually activates tomb bosses. You don't actually have to complete the tea Tea rooms to activate them. Well, that is about it for anything you need to know about tea rooms and the Tomb of the Ancients. But you know what happens now. You've killed all five Sarks, teleport back to base, and now it's time to face off against the three tomb bosses. You see, the first thing you gotta know about this is that there are two types of tombs you can do. Clean, and FFA. FFA implies free-for-all, where everybody spams their abilities and hits whatever boss they can at whatever time they can. The problem with that? All three bosses have now been activated at the same time, meaning you must deal with the wrath of these three incredibly powerful gods, rendering melee classes basically ineffective unless they have a death wish. I would bet that if there's a wizard, archer, sorcerer, and especially an assassin, it's probably gonna be FFA. But if you all decide to do a clean tomb, here's what you gotta do. The order of damaging these bosses goes Bess, Nut, then Jeb. I heard that there used to be an order of Nut Best Jeb, because Nut is the healer of the bunch, so while you're attacking Bess, he'll be slowly regaining his HP, but as long as you're dealing a substantial amount of damage every rotation, it's not enough to bog down the experience. Alright, so Bess is the tank of the trio. High defenses, a lot of health, staple stuff. Now, that's not to say he can't deal his fair amount of damage, because... No, he, he certainly can. But he's not all about dealing damage. His main forms of attack are these armor-breaking crescent shots, very deadly, and these humongous bullets that, when armor broken, can deal 240 damage. I learned that the hard way. I should say now that there are two ways you can take down each of these bosses. The first and most efficient way is to stand in the middle and slowly circle around the room with the boss. This way you can continue to deal your damage and observe when the boss enters its next phase. But if you want to go the safe route, stand by one of the four pillars and wait for the boss to rotate to you. Come out of hiding, deal your damage, go back behind the pillar to avoid the projectiles. Just keep in mind you'll be missing out on loads of DPS. Also, before the tomb bosses actually start damaging you, you have to get them out of their awakening phase. Just keep on whacking him around until he goes into his battle phase. You'll know it when it happens because he'll start shooting actual projectiles. There are also text cues for each phase. Awakening phase, he says this will now be your tomb. The battle phase, he says impudence, I am an immortal, I needn't take you seriously. The others use tricks, but I shall stun you with my brute strength. Odd, my wondrous 
defense, not disable our foes, and for his rage phase, we'll get to that later, the end of your path is here. During his battle phase though, the more that you damage him, the more he will start to fire. Now Bess's shotgun covers quite a bit of area. This is why going in with a melee is super risky, because you have to have the reaction time and speed required to run around that shotgun. Range characters have so much less to worry about because they're farther back. You can dodge the bullets with ease because you have so much time. Knights, of course, shine not just on Bess, but all three of the Doom bosses. Stunning the boss, preventing them from attacking you, it's just great. But towards the end of his battle phase, Bess will actually spawn pyramid artifacts that surround not only him, but the other tomb bosses as well. And even if Bess dies, they remain. While they can damage you, it's not much. The real pain is that it weakens you for two seconds, and they just get in the way from actually hitting Bess. Ninjas, archers, and huntresses, good on you. But then once he goes under a certain amount of health, the rage phase begins. He turns red, chases the nearest player, and unleashes a monsoon of stuns. If you're on a knight and you go in for the stun, as soon as Bess sees you. He's going to immediately stun you before you even have a chance to get close. So you really gotta fake him out here. Use pillars to hide behind, and wait for Bess to get real close before you jump him. If you see that your stun is going to miss, don't try and throw out a second one, because I practically guarantee you it will not work. Also, quicksand. I didn't mention this earlier, but quicksand is one of the deadliest components of the tomb, because the longer you stand in it, the more you sink, and the more your ground speed is depleted. When trying to run away from a boss in rage, this is your worst nightmare. If you have to run through quicksand at all, make sure it's in a straight line. Plan your path ahead of time. This is where I find ranged classes to be especially advantageous. Instead of needing to get right up close and personal to Bess, you can just fire from a distance. An archer paralyzed with Doombo is a fantastic combo, but please do not underestimate estimate the range of these stunning shots. They go very far, and can easily reach you across large distances. Still though, unless you're on a knight, fighting best on a melee can be a little touch and go. A little tedious, might take some extra time, unless you really know how to mess with his AI. And we already touched upon this earlier, but rogues are so useful in here. Not just for rushing and killing all the Sarks without getting injured, but fighting the bosses one at a time without being detected. You could solo this entire dungeon without even getting hurt. And on a rogue, that is not a very tall order. You just have to properly manage your mana, and make sure that you anticipate when you're going to uncloak. Overall though, Bess is definitely the easiest of the three. It just takes some proper timing. Gotta study his pattern for a little bit. Learn when to go in and when to go out. Overall though, a decently challenging boss. But now we've got Nut. Okay? And I'll tell you right now, she is a completely different monster. Nut is known more for being a healer and crowd controller, and she has access to a handful of debuffs that more or less will ruin your day. Now everything starts out normal with an awakening phase. She'll circle around the room like the others, heal anyone who's left, and fire her occasional weakens until she's eventually damaged out into her battle phase. The taunts for her awakening phase are enough of your vandalism. The battle phase, best become my wall of defense. Jeb, eradicate these creatures from our tomb. My artifacts shall make your lethargic lives end much more swiftly. And finally, her rage phase, this cannot be, you shall not succeed. And trust me, we will get to that. When her battle phase begins though, she'll start firing out a bunch of colored crescent shots. The white ones quieting you for one second, the blue ones weakening you for five seconds, the green ones slowing you for five seconds, and the pink ones blinding you for five seconds. Luckily, these are not hard to avoid at all. They have a very predictable pattern, but as you're circling the tomb, this also applies to Bess's shots. Make sure you're not standing at the point where they were fired because they will boomerang around and come right back to that spot. And in tomb boss fashion, Nut will go in and out of vulnerability. So make sure that she doesn't have that shield above her head when you go to damage her. Once additional damage has been dealt, Nut will actually go into the infamous hugging phase, where Nut picks a partner, probably Jeb if you're doing it right, they put up shields and start hugging. <laughs> Literally, they're right on top of each other, moving in unison. Once their shields go down, if you want to keep this tomb clean, you have to stop what you're doing and wait for this phase to be over if you don't want to accidentally hit Jeb. Luckily, it doesn't take very long. The rotations will slowly go out of sync, but it is a tad jarring. Once the phase is over, though, she'll start throwing out these icy-looking paralysis bullets. It only lasts for one second, but because there's so many of them, getting hit with one of these while you're stuck in the rotation next to the other two tomb bosses, it can be a little scary, I agree. They move in a clockwise pattern, so if you want to circle around her, in a clockwise pattern too to match the bullets. That's a really efficient way of getting your damage in. But you can always hide behind pillars too if you want to wait for the rotation to pass. Or heck, you can just stay back for the whole thing if you want to. That's always an option. Oh, and I forgot to mention, during the hugging phase and from there on, she'll start firing off two types of arrows. A small black type, worth 40 damage and armor break you for three seconds. In combination with the two extremely large arrows, worth 200 damage and paralyzing you for 1.4 seconds. It's pick your poison here, sure, but I think the choice here is obvious. 
armor broken is terrible. A 200 damage paralysis is no good. She'll also spawn Sphinx artifacts. Now don't worry, it's not the damage here that you have to worry about. I mean, unless there's a lot of them. But they will inflict slow on you. And in combination with all the other debuffs going around, it's just insult to injury. Luckily, they go down pretty fast, although they do have invulnerable phases. So keep on your toes. A good time to attack her is right after she shoots. Because her cooldown is fresh, you have a good amount of time before she fires again. Damage her some more after that, and you'll finally push her to rage. Nuts! rage phase. You know, watching people take this down, it's pretty invigorating, I will say. And taking it down myself feels good. It feels like a genuine reward. It's a struggle. It's a challenge. But mark my words, folks. Nut rage is complete and utter carnage. The sheer number of bullets Nut unleashes on the player is obscene. Props to all the players that can take out Nut Rage close range combat without using a knight. That is truly impressive. But to all the new guys watching, you can use your HP bars to indicate when Nut is about to go into rage. When you see this, you can step back from the fight and let the other players initiate. If you're ranged and Nut is coming after you, you have a little bit of time before she reaches you. Remember, she has low health at this point. You don't have to Nexus just because she caught sight of you. Try and deal some damage, and if she gets really close, you get paralyzed by a giant arrow, you're not feeling like you can live another couple seconds next. If you're a knight, you gotta keep her stunned before she goes into rage and continue to stun her over and over. Bring some magic potions with you. Something worth noting, however, is that, like the other bosses, Nut is provoked to attack you. However, with proper positioning, you can get her stuck in certain spots. I'm not sure what triggers her. Hey, <laughs> you said triggered! Shut up. But I know that there is a way to manipulate her AI. I just, you know. Don't know how to do it. But once that's all said and done, we can finally move on to the last boss of the dungeon. Jeb. For the third time, we have an awakening phase, where he fires off weakens, damage him, he'll go to the battle phase. His awakening phase taunt is, you have awakened us, battle phase, nut, protect me at once, even though she's dead. My artifacts shall destroy you from your soul to your flesh. And his rage phase, ah, you shall pay for your crimes. Now, what's ironic about Jeb is, in the beginning, he doesn't really do anything. He takes a beating for quite a substantial amount of damage, throwing out a few red bullets that aren't too bad. You can dodge him pretty well. Meanwhile, he is tossing out a few grenades, but as long as you keep in the rotation and mind your surroundings, you shouldn't be running into them. Eventually though, he will fire out his trademark black bullets, and quite a number of them. You have one that deals 280, even more than Bess, and one that deals 200. But they look the same, so it's really hard to tell which one you're getting hit by. At the same time, some scarabs are spawned. This is where it starts getting tricky. Yes, they aren't very strong, and they can go down very quickly, and I'll bet that you'll be able to kill them before they even get the chance to paralyze you. Then he starts tossing out green crescents like Nut, dealing 100 damage and slowing you for 5 seconds. So slowly over time, Jeb is firing more and more bullets. As the phase goes on, he keeps adding these shots to his arsenal. At this point in time, it's actually getting pretty tricky to dodge all of his shots. Melees, while tanky, yes, are still going to have a rough time here. But once it gets to about a little under half health, he will spawn Nile artifacts. These things are the devil incarnate. On top of having temporary invulnerability phases, they deal 190 damage per shot. They also usually travel in pairs. They also fire very quickly, meaning if you walk over one or two of these, you can get popped very fast. In addition, these Nile artifacts will both surround Jeb's body and go after players. Kill them. Kill them with fire. Get them out of play. Have somebody lure the artifacts away to a corner and take them out. That way, the other players can focus on getting the damage and just ending this fiasco. Not to mention the paralysis from the scarabs. Getting paralyzed next to a Nile artifact? It's a death sentence. This phase is usually too dangerous for ranged characters to hang around, so you probably will end up standing back. Approach the corners with caution. Try and shoot him as he comes around the bend. Then retreat, lure away the artifacts, kill the scarabs, whatever you gotta do to survive. Then once enough damage is dealt, Jeb will rage. And this is kind of an interesting rage, because first, he actually jumps away from the players. Similar to how the jackal reacts, where once he gets low enough, he'll actually run away from the players, it's kind of what happens here. When you get close enough to Jeb, he'll jump away. However, if he's backed up into a corner, and unable to move backwards, he'll bounce towards the center of the room, attacking any players in the crossfire. There's actually a really good video by a previous Realm YouTuber by the name of Jerry L. He shows you how to do Jeb Rage on a melee without Ghost Pirate Realm. It's a really informative video, and I recommend you all give it a watch. But if you want to take the coward's way out, the safer way out. You can use your ranged character to kill him off screen. Archers do have to get a little bit closer, but now it's really just a war of attrition. Take a couple of shots at him, he'll shoot you back, maybe he'll jump, go after him again, and repeat. While I still think that Nut Rage is a lot scarier, Jeb Rage is equally as dangerous. And so with all three bosses defeated, let's go over that loot. The tomb bosses have a lot of items that they all drop that are similar, and then they also have their own specific items that they drop themselves. They all drop potions of life, which is kind of the main thing of the tomb. That means you can actually walk away with the tomb with three life. It's possible 
possible to walk it with three, but you typically go with two or one, sometimes none. That's a very rare occasion, but it sucks and it does happen. The treasures in the tomb are the Golden Ankh, Eye of Osiris, and the Pharaoh's Mask. They can also drop a Wine Cellar Incantation. Best can drop a Ring of the Pyramid or a Tome of Holy Protection. Uh, the worst white bag in the tomb is the Ring of the Sphinx, and that is dropped by Nut. Geb can drop the Ring of the Nile, but he also drops two parts of the Geb set, and those parts are the Scepter of Geb, which is the Wand, and the Book of Geb, which is the Tome. All in all, guys, the Tomb of the Ancients is a fantastic dungeon. Challenging, yes, and I don't recommend it for beginners to try out, unless you're in a very large group, and you're not controlling a very valuable character of yours. But in time, you will come to realize how worthwhile this dungeon is. Three bosses, three life, it's great. With that being said, though, guys, that's it. We did it. Man, how, how do you feel? Feeling pretty good, man. I'm really happy that we were able to get it done finally after two years. But hey, I think it was worth the wait, right? Yeah, me too. I'm glad we got this done. Well, thank you guys so much for watching. And as always, don't forget to check out the next episode whenever I post it, which will probably be soon. All right. See ya.